a completely different uh, approach that Foam has actually done. It's just more focused on the art space. And then we have a late uh, addition of a special guest artist from Toronto, Matt Scully, who's the CEO of Nico. Nico is one of the original uh, founders of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, and he's going to talk about his cross-blockchain uh, <coughs> development. So I'll pass it over to these guys. Thanks, guys. Great, I'm going this. Can you hear us? Is it working? Microphones? All good. All right. I'm Matt. This is John. Um, we are Barba Labs. This is the CryptoPunks. Um, and basically, the CryptoPunks are 10,000 unique uh, characters, all generated uh, to be unique. And they got a bunch of different features and so on. And uh, that's all of them. <laughs> there they all are there. <laughs> Have a look at those. Yeah, yeah so, so here they are. And, uh, and so the idea is, yeah, that they were launched um, onto the uh, Ethereum blockchain and, and they were able to be claimed for free. So just, if you just paid the transaction fee, you could, you could claim one. You could associate one of these with your uh, Ethereum address. And then once they were all claimed, or even before that time, you could offer them for sale and you could buy them. So there was like a little aftermarket for these, for these little characters. Uh, here's, here's a little look at how the generator, you know, works. It's all just different, you know, it's kind of mixing and matching all these little elements. And there's a little more stuff to make them kind of look all right, but that's kind of how it works. Here's an example, CryptoPunk 9609. And you can see we, we lay out sort of the accessories and it, a little sense of the rarity, you know, it's like, oh, 501 other punks have those same sunglasses. And so our, our kind of our basic idea was like, can we make a lot of these things, but have sort of a collectible, collect, collectible uh, feel to it? So there's rarity for certain items. There's like certain types of people are more rare than others. Humans are the most common. There's also apes, zombies, and aliens. And then if we make this all ownable, verifiable on the Ethereum blockchain, like what happens? Like we didn't really know the answer to that question. So this was kind of the whole point here was like, we had these little guys, John wrote this generator and we had 10,000 of them. We're like, well, what happens if we make it so you can buy and sell these dudes on there? Dudes and ladies, I should say. And zombies. And zombies. I and apes and aliens. And apes and aliens. <laughs> <laughs> we, we were hoping to actually put the images themselves on to the Ethereum network, but that would have cost us a fortune in uh, transaction fees. <laughs> so, so what we actually just did is in the contract, we have this like image hash and you can verify that, you know, that this is associated with that basically, that this contract is talking about those images. So that was a little bit of indirection we had to do. But, uh, and that was kind of a question too, like, cause part of this is technical. What are the limitations? We didn't even know this is our first uh, Solidity contract. So we, but then there's also sort of psychological stuff. Like, do people feel like they're owning these guys? Uh, if there's a, just an image hash in the contract or do we need it to have the actual like ping data in the blockchain for people to feel like they own it? We didn't really know the answer to that, that either. Um, so but we went for this cause we just didn't have enough money to do the other way. So. It's important to note that we had never written a scrap of solidity before. <laughs> and you'll see how that worked out. 
Uh, <laughs> but what our plan was is, yeah, was to support that claiming and then this offering for punks and, you know, you can offer them for sale and then you can also uh, buy them. We didn't have a bidding system yet. That, that came later. And, uh, and then we wrote a, a website that you just saw kind of a screenshot from that sort of shows all the information that allows you to sort of browse them and see them, see who owns them. But we didn't have any actual built-in Web3 functionality. That's where you can actually interact with a contract using Mist or MetaMask, like one of those clients that actually ties it in with uh, Ethereum. We didn't have that. But we went ahead and, and we launched this thing on June 9th. Can I just ask a couple of questions so we know what kind of audience it is? How many people here are developers? And uh, how many people have written a Solidity contract before? And how many people have like a MetaMask plugin or know what it is, that kind of thing, missed? Okay. Okay, so pretty good. Everyone's basically, yeah. yeah. We didn't know any of that before we started. So people <laughs> were like, we made this website and it was like, you know, you could click around, but you couldn't do anything with it. And as soon as we launched it, someone was like, you yes. got to support Miss, man. You got to do MetaMask. And we're like, looked it up. Yeah, and we're Google like, search. That would yeah. have been great. <laughs> You're right. So anyways, the first version of the site was very simple. Yeah, yeah so, so we launched it and we didn't, you know, we just sort of posted it to our Ethereum subreddit and that kind of stuff. And there was a few people in there claiming a few punks, but it was pretty quiet at first. The first maybe week or so, not much, right? Maybe a week and a half. <sighs> yeah, like a few hundred. And you still have to pay like, you know, transaction fees. So it's not free. You can't just click buttons and get free guys. So you got to spend like a little bit of money. And there was 10,000 of them. And in that first week, we were sort of thinking like, man, there's like this ocean of unclaimed punks. Like, is that too many? Like, is 10,000 like a dumb number? Like, it should it have been 1,000? Should it have been 100? Um, yeah, we just kind of didn't, didn't, weren't really getting quite the reception we needed to make the 10,000 number work, so. Uh, and Mashable wrote this, and, uh, and then things got going. Um, so that this was on, uh, I don't know, June, I can't remember. I think it was like a Thursday, Thursday or yeah. Friday. Oh, yeah, Friday. The 16th, yes, so on a Friday. And, um, and that was it. Within one day of that publication, uh, they had all been claimed. Um, some people had claimed over 1,000 of them, which, which is real money, because it, it, they were paying a what, on average, 20 cents a transaction or something. <laughs> the one guy, so we were just talking about this before, but so suddenly it went from being like a few handful, like I have eight being claimed to like a, a thousand. Like, so it was like consistently just like nonstop. There's this queued transaction and all that stuff. I'm like, oh, people are scripting it now. They're just kind of grabbing them all. But we found out later that a guy was just typing them in. Like he did not know how to do it. He was just super excited about it. He was like, I got to get these punks. And he was paying top dollar for gas. So he didn't understand even that you could bid on gas, that you could spend a lower uh, fee on that. So I think he spent over a dollar per one of those claim transactions. Yeah. So he spent a thousand bucks out of pocket just to get things that we kind of intended to be free like as cheap as we could make them like 10 cents was sort of what we estimated it would cost he was spending a buck per mm -hmm. at that time which at that time felt crazy yeah turns out he's okay but, yeah. uh yeah, yeah he got made whole but um so and and so during that day this is during the day on saturday um i don't know if you can see but we're the third so this is like um on the ETH gas station website, it shows like what are the top contracts in terms of gas spent, and we were number three overall. And ENS is always number one. I, I think that was some ICO in the uh, in the middle there. So we were definitely there was a lot going on. Uh, we were in a lot of uh, blocks that day. And then look at this sale. Uh, this is um, this is an ETH scan. Someone bought one of these aliens. There's only nine aliens. They're the most rare thing. They bought it for ten ether, which at the time that's worth a lot right now, um, but Actually, I mean, I think Ether's up over 300 bucks now, but it was 350 at, when this happened. So, so we, we went from like, whoa, people are spending the transaction fees. So like someone <laughs> yeah. just dropped $3,500 on one of these guys. <laughs> yeah, that it, it was the same day. day. This is Saturday. It was in like yeah. within 24 hours. It went yeah. from like, ah, no one's going to take these things. This is stupid to being like, oh man, everybody's grabbing them. And then like, I, I had one that I thought was actually like a pretty cool punk. That this is this is a sad story now, but so I had it for sale for like um, like eight dollars, which at the time these were ten cents. So I'm like eight bucks, and then someone bought it. I'm like someone spent eight bucks on a punk. Like that's weird. Let's put one up for a hundred bucks. Someone bought that. Like what's going on? And then it was like three hundred. Then it was like five hundred. Not like it's, some of those were special. Special punk. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay, don't get me wrong. These aren't like standard punks. These are like these are like sort of zombies and so on. But uh, yeah, but it went from very quickly from being this this pile of ping files to this thing where people were getting into the details and like, ah, well, I'm into this thing and I'm into that. So. And I should mention that I just overlaid the image of the punk. Etherscan doesn't doesn't put the punk images in. Not yet. We're going to talk to them. Um, okay, then this happened. <laughs> then it, it was all. 
toast. It turned out that we had a bug in our contract, and it, when you bought a punk, you got the punk, and you also got the money back. <laughs> it went back to you. <laughs> and the guy who bought that for 10 Ether didn't know that. But then, of course, wow. some people figured it out and, and ran the table, and they, they bought everything. And what was crazy was someone had, someone had a, a punk for sale for 200 Ether. You, know, you can put whatever number you want in there. Yeah. Someone bought it knowing they could withdraw it. But even then, it's like, how sure were you you could withdraw that? Yeah. They, they, they're just like, oh, oh get the, yeah. it's a free punk. It's we, like, are you sure? Yeah, you, you still didn't have that. You still, like, our bug filled contract, you still, put, you still put 200 ether into it, hoping you, you know, yeah. thinking, I'm pretty sure I'll get it back. The only thing you know for sure is that our contract sucks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it was something like someone, that guy who ended up kind of running the table and cleaning out all of these things for sale, he put something like 300 grand worth of ether through the contract. He, he said, said, later we talked to this guy too, and uh, he said he tried it with them, some small ones, and he was like, that'll ah, probably be fine. Like, probably be fine. Yeah, like, and for all he know, we, we, like, we had a little like, oh, if it's more than, you know, <laughs> yeah. 100, send it our way. Yeah, right. but yeah, so anyway, so th we were completely floorless, like, oh, no. You know, and we were, because we were neophytes, we just hadn't really thought through, like, oh, there's no way to update this. You know what I mean? Like, we, we're just third parties now too, so... And sort of our normal way of operating is we put stuff out there and if people get excited about it, then we work on it and we improve it. And like the first version is just sort of to test the waters. And that totally does not work with Ethereum contracts. We didn't fully realize that. So there was a like very specific, awful feeling that I've ex now only experienced doing this. Like, you know, when you make a big bug as a developer, it's like pretty, it sucks. But then you got to like uh, fix the database, do all that stuff. This was like, we busted it and there's no way to fix it. Like that's yeah. not a normal thing. So I was trying to think of like, how do you compare Ethereum development to like other kinds of development? And the best I could get to was like the Apollo missions. Like it's like, yeah. we're, we're, putting, we're putting software on this rocket and sending it to the moon. Like, and you know what, and I even then works. I read that they updated the Apollo lander once. Like it was a big <laughs> deal, but they updated it. We couldn't, we couldn't do that. So yeah, not that, you know, I mean, that's more important, but still. Yeah, that's how it felt. And so, just, I, so some of you guys are technical. Um, I, we just kind of want to show the bug. And, you know, so this is part of the contract, the part that sort of matters. And those two lines that are highlighted, if you reverse the order of, of that line, then the bug doesn't happen. And, uh, and so we'll just sort of get into the details of it. So there's this, this structure called offer there. And what we didn't realize is that those things are pointers. They're always represented as a pointer. Once you have a struct like that, it's a pointer. So, so what we're trying to do when you buy a punk is we're trying to say, well, it's no longer for sale now. And when we call that, and that's where this, that, so this is sort of this, um, this is the second highlighted thing now. Um, we're, what we're doing is we're sort of clearing out that object. We're saying, oh, set a new offer. And that first, that thing that is for sale, we're setting the false. So we're saying, oh, it's basically not for sale. And because it's not for sale, we don't, and we, we don't even really care who's offering it for sale. Like we, so we just, almost by a miracle, we just said message.sender, which in this case will be whoever's sending the message is the person buying the punk, right? But we also could have just set that to zero x zero, which is like the null address. That's probably the more correct way. Yeah, well, at the end there, we did that because it's like, well, why not? It doesn't matter anymore. Let's just make it null. Yeah. But yeah. we just didn't do that. If we had done that, if we had set that to zero x zero, then we would have been just sinking that money. That money would have all just disappeared. No one would have been able to claim it. It would have been gone forever. And we would not be here today. <laughs> but, but anyway, so, the, so then what happens is, you know, we, we reference that array to get the offer object. And then what we don't realize is that when we call punk longer for sale, we're actually re replacing that offer up. So the offer object that we think we have that has offer.seller, and that's the person who's, who is selling the offer, we, we don't realize that we have replaced that with message.sender. So we're sending the money rather than pending withdrawals, which is that that's the money that you now are owed because you sold the punk, rather than that being assigned to the buyer, it's being assigned to the, it's being a, yeah, sorry, to the seller, it's being assigned to the buyer. Okay. I'm getting it wrong even now. So anyway, yeah, so that was, it took us, I mean, I think it took us a couple hours to even figure out that we had a bug. Yeah, like that, how we know? found out about the bug was that we, we did a, uh, bought something and then it didn't get the money. And we're like, uh-oh. And, uh, and then we're like, well, where's the bug? And then we, it took forever, yeah. And what was crazy was we had written test cases and our test cases, our unit tests had a corresponding bug. We just accidentally were checking to make sure that the buyer got the money when they, because it was all like address number zero, address number one, address number two. Yeah. So we got confused and we had, we had, a, we had a matching bug. In the, it, just, it just shows unit tests only compare that two things 
<laughs> are the yeah. same. It doesn't mean it's right. It just means they're the same. We very carefully and in an automated fashion verified that it was wrong. That's what we accomplished with our unit test, which is pretty great. And then even further, and this is just stupid on our part, is we, when we, de we deployed the contract on the test net, right? Like the Ethereum test net. And we were sort of banging away in the contract a bit. And like, I sold him a punk for one ether and he sold me a punk for one ether. And then I'm like, oh, I got the money. And he got his money. <laughs> it's just completely stupid. <laughs> so we did like, we, yeah, we weren't paranoid. And now we know you, you have to be completely paranoid. When you write Ethereum, you have to just assume you literally have to test maniacally. And yeah, we know that now. And so now we had to figure out what to do. Uh, and uh, yeah, like I said, we were lucky that we weren't just sinking. Like, the, fact, like, the good thing is we could say like, hey, everyone get your money back. And because we have a full history of like who owned what and who bought and sold, we were like, if we move this all over to a new contract, we can kind of recreate everything. We can get everyone back to what they owed before they sold anything. Everyone who bought something can get their money back minus the transaction fees that people sunk. But um, so yeah, we, there was another approach we could have taken, which was to do like a, people were telling us maybe you could do like a, like a proxy contract that just sort of sits in front of that contract and just, it just, it runs the sales and then just does transfers of the punks in the background. But that just seemed like it would be really too complicated, complicated for users. Yeah. But there were people arguing and we didn't know at this point whether which, which argument made more sense was they were saying that like, no, this contract that you've deployed, that's the crypto punks, like that's the ownership. If you make another contract, that's just a different one. You know, it's like the classic fork situation yeah. again. Yeah, and a couple of these were threatening to make their own proxy contract. Like, well, we're just yeah. going to do this. And yeah. this is before we had like the whole web UI really. So, there, you know, I mean, if someone else had done it, they could have just kind of almost like taken it away from us. But so anyway, but we decided like, well, the way we want to do it, the way that we think will be better is, is that option one. So we, we did that and uh, more carefully this time. We wrote massive tests, unique values on all sales and all that kind of stuff co-prime sale values <laughs> uh, um, added uh, and we but we also we, we, while we were you know thinking about it we realized we wanted to add bidding the idea that you could bid on a punk and you actually put the money in there that was that was hard to decide on though too say hey do you want to also make this twice as complicated <laughs> yeah like we just blew it we might have fixed it do you want to like up it do you want to go crazy here and add like yeah. you know five times more stuff double or nothing yeah, yeah. so uh but we were like, we got to do it. It'll, it'll, it will be so much better if bidding supported. And we can go, we'll go into a little more detail how all this stuff works um, once we kind of get through the timeline here. And uh, so, our, so we had, we went kind of like a tough weekend working on that. And Monday we were cranking away. And then we were sort of like, all right, I think on Tuesday we can start. Because we had to transfer all the data. And that was going to be all these transactions to like, because to, to, um, we had a special function that we were going to call as the owner of the contract to like set who, here's who owns what. And we were like, that's going to cost us like 400 bucks of transactions because these are really heavy transactions. There's 200 of them and each of them setting 50 punks. So 10,000. And we were doing them all like manually and stuff, trying to pick a gas value that works. But then like right when we were ready to do that was when this is, yeah, this is when like the status ICO happened. And that was, I don't know if you remember that time, but there was like 10,000 pending transactions at all times. Like you couldn't get transactions through and, it, and, if you want, really needed to get something through, you had to pay a fortune in gas. Like it would have cost us, if we had tried to ram it through yeah. during this time, it might've cost us like thousands of dollars, maybe 10,000 yeah. bucks. So, so we were just sort of stalled. That was so frustrating. Uh, we were just sitting there and, and everyone's like, when's it gonna be ready? I thought you said the contract's ready. Like, why isn't it launched yet? <laughs> and that, that, during that whole week, we're just sort of waiting for the pending transactions to clear out. That image is a little sensational i just got this <laughs> I, I was trying to find a new site that like was talking about this <laughs> yeah, that's a live image that was that's really, what happened yeah, yeah. No, that's what it looked like that airplane yep. was that's real. was, was yep. running a smart contract yep um yeah so so, so once like, that finally cleared out it was a uh, friday of that week and um and it's, we still had to pay more in transactions but it wasn't that bad we were able to get it done by, for about 600 bucks i think it took us all friday to run those transactions through yeah all 200 of them it took a full day um, each we were, I think we were something like ha more than half of each block that we were in. Yeah. For a while there, yeah, so. each of, yeah. Each of these was about 2 million, 2 million gas. That means anything to people, which is quite a bit. That's like, yeah, it's about half a block at the time. Now it's blocks are a bit bigger. Um, but it, everything worked. I mean, we, actually, we had a bug, right? But it was more, it was minor yeah. enough. Like it's weird that we had a, we had a, like, even with all our testing, we still found like a little bug with like our event code, but it's not important. It just kind of makes the website a little harder to, to, for us to work with, but it's fine. Just shows how tough it is. But um, anyway, yeah. yeah and, and those who were threatening to sort of bail, they, they didn't. They, they were fine with the new contract. So that was nice. 
Uh, a lot of the sales were redone, which was cool. Like people just sort of replayed those events. The big, like that 10 Ether one happened again, which was cool. Yeah, when that happened, we were like, oh man, not only have we blown this contract, but there was a 10 Ether purchase of an alien and now like that's gone. Like, are they going to do it again? And then the, the person who bought, we thought like, or maybe it was, wasn't a real transaction. Like maybe they knew about it and they were just doing this to, to get a free alien. Uh, who wouldn't? So then, but then he emailed us and said, like, I'm worried that that person's not going to want to redo that. I am desperate to spend 10 Ether on an alien. Do you think they'll want to do it again? And we were like, probably. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll, actually, we'll talk about that guy who sold yeah. that a little later, too. Yeah, that's, it's a funny thing. But yeah, so yeah, so everyone was still keen. They were on board, which is great. So, so then, then we just now we're now we could finally settle down and, and just kind of keep making things better. So, so this, this is when we, you know, so this is kind of how it looks now. Um, this is an example of like, if you're on the page, like looking at a specific punk, and this is one that, so I, I just took the screenshot. So I own this particular punk and someone has a little bid for a small amount, just like a, there's a lot of like people who just put in low bids just to see if you'll bite. This is a low bid. I can tell you, <laughs> um, 15 bucks over, but anyway, so, so I can, so right from the web interface now using MetaMask or, or Mist, I can say accept bid, or I can offer for sale for a price that I decide. I can transfer it to another address. If this was a punk I didn't own, there would also be a button to buy it. So you, that's basically how you operate. It's almost like a little market for each of these punks where you can, you know, there's a, there's a high bid, there's an offer for sale, and, and a, a little market is made by that. And when you put a bid up, you put the money into the contract. So we're the escrow. We hold your money. So there's, oh, well, that's later, but however much, there's a bunch of bids sitting in there that we're holding the money. So the, the seller can come and say like, okay, I accept, and the transaction happens. Yeah. Same with the offer for sale. Yeah, like if I accept right now, then then the money just gets transferred to me directly. And then the flip side is true too. If I offer for sale, then if someone shows up with the money, they immediately get the punk. So it's sort of, there's a balance there. Uh, yeah. yeah, so that's how that works. Here's an example, transaction history. This, this actually, actually, I think this might be the one you were talking about. No, 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 no I don't think so. But it's one of the ones that originally you oh. sold. You sold oh, it originally. This was kind of right. Yeah, this it wasn't eight bucks. bucks. It was thirty bucks. Yeah, that's the one that Matt said he sold right away, and then later it got flipped for yeah, yeah. one hundred eighty-eight bucks. <sighs> one hundred eighty-eight bucks bid, man. <laughs> oh no, yeah, it hasn't been sold yet. Someone's not. It's worth more than someone's not accepting point six five. I wish this yeah. wasn't in the presentation. It's breaking my heart looking at this. We have, we have a little search feature, so you can kind of like, if you're interested in like certain characteristics, you can kind of find all the punks, which is fun. We also have, there was a lot of, people wanted to know like, well, what's the old, you know, like, there's just, people wanted to be able to kind of slice and dice these things all different ways. So this just sort of shows like, okay, so these are the so-called special types, the ones that are like non-human. And then, and then there's also just kind of all the attributes, like what's the most rare attribute, you know, it's the beanie and that kind of stuff. So. So, so we have all that in the site. But there are, there are definitely collectors out there too, people who focus on certain things like the pilot helmets have been super hot lately. Yeah, that kind of thing. So uh, I've been selling all our pilot helmets, for example. And we, the, a key thing we have is there's a Discord um, chat room. You know, Discord's like a, kind of like a Slack style chat, but a little bit more public than Slack. And, um, and, we, and we have a bot, like the CryptoPunk bot is in there and it, it announces all activities. So it's like, oh, here's a bid on this. This is for sale. This sale happens. So that's sort of the place where you can kind of hang out and just sort of see what's going on. And, and people like chat about things and yeah, discuss what's rare, what should be valued more or less or anything. So that's a pretty key aspect to it that there's like this, there's this kind of home that people can discuss. There's things. a Twitter uh, account too that tweets all the sales. That's true. Yep. The bot's in a Discord chat room. Uh, Discord is like, it's like Slack. It's like what gamers use, but, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's like a, it's Slack like thing, but it, and it was originally used by gamers. Like, 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 Oh, our guild is on there or whatever, but, um, uh, it has good bot integration and it's, it's more, it's easier to make public things. So you, rather than Slack, you have to like invite everyone to a Slack. This is, you can just make public chat rooms on Discord. So that's why we use Discord, but it's basically very much like Slack. There's a, there's a link to it on the CryptoPunks site. If you want to go there. Yep. And then this is interesting. So this is all the, this is the top, these are the, all the punks listed sort of like uh, left to right, top to bottom in, in descending order of, of their top bid. So like that very top left um, blonde haired punk has a bid of 13 ether right now. And it's weird that you think like, well, why? Like that doesn't seem that rare, but that's punk number zero. Like that's the very first punk. So that, and then, and then the aliens, and then that fourth one, that's a weird one too. That, that, that punk has more, like uh, features than any other punk. Like he's got like the top hat, the shades, the earring. <laughs> he's got buck teeth. 
a beard, cigarette. Like, <laughs> just, How many does he have? I think it's seven in total. I, I don't know if I missed Is there one. only one that has seven features? Yeah, that that's what they the only one out? that has seven features. So, so it, it, and then, then, then that one a little later, that's uh, the bald one. That one has no features. And then there's the female one with no features. So these are, it's been sort of worked out by the community, you know, what, how people value things. And so it's sort of fun to look at it. Yeah, there was that guy in the chat who was like, guess what? Aliens are the most rare. No features are the most rare. There's only four of them. I've done the math. Like, all right. He's like, I'm paying top dollar for these because one day they're going to be the most valuable. Like, and, and it kind of like, <laughs> they're worth more than he said they were. Yeah, it, was, it, it kind of worked. Right. I was like, well, I'll sell you mine, man. I don't know if that makes sense or not. And he's done like great with them. So, yeah. So it's interesting how it's gone. And uh, yeah. Um, now, this guy, yeah, this is the vacationing, we call him the vacationing alien owner. This is the guy who sold that one for 10 uh, ether. And look how much he's, look how much, he, he showed up and claimed all the rare ones or a bunch of the rare ones. Um, look how much he's made. And uh, what was crazy is we, we ended up talking to this guy in that Discord chat. And the entire time he was selling these, he was on vacation in Sri Lanka. And he, he was like, yeah, every day I just go hike. I was hiking like these different mountains and stuff. And I would just come down off the mountain and like sell like a buck or two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then he'd be like, "Extend my trip." Yeah, and he goes, I, 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 "Yeah, my vacation's gone a little longer than expected." So yeah, he's had a great time, but he's almost out now. He's basically sold through his stock. Um, so yeah, the vacationing alien owner is a fun guy. Yeah, these are just a few stats. Uh, not really. Yeah, the average price. That's of course that average price is. You know, there's some heavy ones in there, and there's some really inexpensive ones. So that's yeah. There, oh, there's the number for, for pending bids. So the contract is managing 205 ether that's sitting there for people to claim. So yep. And Punk Zero is the 13 ether bid. Yep. So, so what we're going to work on next? Uh, what we really want to do is what's hard. We haven't quite figured out the best way to do it is we really want to make sure everyone's getting notified properly. So there's a couple, a couple guys who are really into it who are in that chat room and then so they can tell what's going on right away but we'd love to have a better way of like notifying people directly like oh your punk got a bid or you know like or that one that you had bid on you you know you got outbid like that kind of stuff and so we're, we're working on that uh there, there's a few different ways we could try to do it like um but we really want to be able to notify people we think that'd be like a real next step uh, there's that Tashi project, which is sort of like a, you know, going to be kind of like a mobile Ethereum client. We think there's some really cool stuff we could do there, enable this stuff as well as maybe like get some profile image stuff going and that kind of thing. And then there might be a way to generalize this. It'd be fun if people could like post their own collectibles and, and, and just have that be like a market and you could trade between sets, you know? So it's like, oh, I'm into CryptoPunks, but I'm also into, you know, I don't know, ponies, br bronies. I don't know. <laughs> Collectibles. <laughs> that's, your, that's your first example. That's my first, that's, that was the first that thing you went to. My, yeah, that was on the top of my head. That's the way you think that's about that. most. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we made a T-shirt. Do you want to go to Cotton Bureau? Get a T-shirt. We, we just kind of made it because we wanted the shirt. They, they do a good job printing shirts. So we have It's less expensive than most punks. Yep, that's true. Just a few things that we've learned. I mean, obviously, we learned about the conservative programming and testing. Like, you can't mess around. The first two points here, yeah, you... Uh, there's no such thing as launch early and iterate unless you're just doing that on test network. That's fine. Um, but also gas is very expensive. You have to really keep your contracts very um, efficient and you, and you have to minimize how much you're storing. Storage is expensive too, which makes sense, right? Because how many computers are you enlisting to store your data when you, when you, do, when you put something on a, into a contract in Ethereum? And also there's not, it's so early yet. There aren't that many Ethereum devs. You know, when we were like asking around, searching on Stack Overflow, it's all pretty early days. A lot of stuff's not yet defined, not figured out the best way to do things. Like, it's surprisingly early days. Um, anything to add there? No. Oh, but uh, I should say that, I mean, these are almost all like negative things. The main positive, of course, is there was something so cool about the fact that this contract now, I mean, we have a website and that we run, but this contract has nothing to do with us. That website could go away, we could go away, 20 years could pass. As long as Ethereum still exists, people can still trade their punks. They can still do all this stuff, you know, like there's, there's nothing like that anywhere else. I don't know how else you can do that. No, like Only this Ethereum project wouldn't that. have worked yeah. at all if we were like, if it was just the website and we're like telling people, you should send us money for these yeah. pictures of punks. Put, it, put, like, in your, put in your credit card and buy a yeah, punk. Yeah, like, just put it in there. Yeah. Call me up to give me the numbers over the phone. I'll do it for you. 
Yeah. yeah. So without the blockchain and without that sort of like um, agreed upon, like people could review it and be like, okay, there's only 10,000 of these. These guys can't steal yeah. them from me once they're in there. The thing is above board. So, you know, if you're on board with um, punks being worth money, then everything else is legit from there on out. So, and because it was so early and we had such an egregious bug that kind of prevented the market from happening, we were able to migrate it once to a new contract. But if we just sort of had like, here's a fun idea, let's change it this way there would be no, we wouldn't necessarily be like, it's kind of its own thing now. And there would almost certainly, especially if you were changing it in a way that was sort of like selfish for us or something, you yeah. know, like they, they would, they, there would certainly be some groupers like, no, we're not doing that. And any, and the website that we have, anyone can make that website. There's nothing special about us as the contract developers that makes it that only we can develop the website. Anyone could do that, you know, they, that front end doesn't have anything to do with, um, with the contract uh, in terms of ownership. So that's, that's really cool. And that's what makes Ethereum so unique. Like, there's nothing else that exists that you can do that with. That's it. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Questions? Just a few, and we'll, then we'll, uh, we'll go ahead. Sorry. So, have you heard of that No. Uh, oh. I feel like I've heard of it once, yeah. <laughs> right. So I wonder if you think this is kind of viable way to. So like, you know this part in the eighteen hundreds of essay by like Walter Benjamin or whatever. Yep. Like, yeah, like yeah, some punks, right? You could like, if you just had this as a JPEG or whatever on the computer, you could probably imprint it many times. But like, they're valuable on the internet. So like. Yeah, it seems like it certainly fills a void in that, yeah, like digital art is sort of unownable right now without something like the blockchain. And so everyone has to sort of agree on it, because obviously you, can, you could still just download all the punks and just have them, you know what I mean? Like there's nothing that prevents you from having those images. So everyone has to sort of agree that that's where it belongs. Um, but it does fill that that niche of like, how do you own digital art and digital works? It also, it's something that we haven't delved into and we're not, you know, lawyers or anything, but there might be some good way of actually like ascribing like kind of like the, the rights to this art, you know, because if you like, if someone paints a painting and then you buy it, you, you don't, you just, you, you still can't, you don't have the reproduction rights. Like you can't make a hundred prints and sell them, right? The artist still can do that. So maybe managing those rights, those core rights of like, of reproduction and royalty and all that, maybe that could be on the blockchain. And that would really make sense. That'd be a really great environment for that, especially for digital works. So that there seems like something really promising at the core of that. Mm -hmm. you, to, you mean like for the website and things like that or? Yeah. So originally we tried to um, embed all the ping data into the contract, which is a totally bad idea. It doesn't work at all. Um, then we tried to put it in event data, um, just to so had the thing write it out. And then we just kind of turned it, it's basically just an image file in GitHub and the hash is in the contract. That's basically the image storage technology. <laughs> um, and we just basically got down to that because we got chased out of those other solutions. Like, you know, when we were wide eyed and optimistic, we thought like, let's just put everything in the blockchain. It'll be great. But obviously that doesn't make a lot of sense once you understand how the whole thing works. It doesn't make sense for everyone in the world to store image data for punks forever. Um, or at least it makes sense that it should be expensive. So, um, so that's why we settled on the hash and that we weren't sure if that would be like contentious or that would be a point of people saying like, well, it's not strong enough a connection between the two things, but it seems fine. Like it's enough to verify that these are the images that are being managed. And then from there you go by what's on the website and in the contract. Yeah. The website is, um, we're Java developers originally. That's why we got like snookered by that, um, uh, by that pointer bug, <laughs> yeah. but also it's, uh, cause that like, that's not how Java works, but, uh, yeah, so we have a Java backend, but then the front end is Vue.js hooked up to Web3. Uh, so it's fairly standard stuff. We're not, we're not like top flight front end engineers, so we sort of grinded it out. But Vue.js seemed pretty, pretty good. <laughs> we should get to the part of where we talk about what we're good at. Yeah, it's no, all right, been right. bad news so far. Yeah. Um, yeah, but that Web3 stuff and MetaMask and MISC is, is really good. Once we got that going, it was like, it, I mean, with the buttons of the bid and stuff, like the first version of this, we should have mentioned, people were just in 
typing in stuff into the contract directly and it was error prone. People were selling stuff they didn't mean to. So that's like a get console, right? Like, you're, like a get client running yeah. and you literally in a terminal window, you're just typing in like, you know, this is the contract ABI. And then I'm going to, you know, like it, like this, this, this the original steps we had was like a 10 step process to actually yeah. doing anything. Yeah. So that's like, that was, I mean, kind of crazy that anyone was actually willing to go through that. But um, once we switched over to this, it's so much nicer. You go to your account page, you can see all the bids you have pending against your, um, against your punks. You can accept a bid right from there. You can see what, what bids you have uh, out against other people's punks, withdraw them up, you know, increase them, all that stuff. So yeah, it's really like that. Once we did that, it was like so much better. It's so much easier. And then the, it, all the like, sort of transaction volume increase and all that stuff. So maybe just time for one more. Unbelievable. Okay. Um, okay. I'm still a little unsure of how the hash of all the 10,000 images works as a way to authenticate um, the, the picture, like actual ownership of the picture. And the other question is um, how do you get started with the previous two alternate sequence of your first step? Yeah. Okay, so the hash does not authenticate ownership per user. It just connects the um, images of all the punks to the contract. So it's just a way to say, like, if we didn't have that in there, you would go to the CryptoPunks contract on the blockchain. And you'd be like, well, what's this thing managing? And there's no connection back to the original asset. So that's just like sort of a link back to that. So you can hash that image and say like, oh, okay, that's what they were intending me to, to buy and sell here. So in terms of actual ownership over a specific punk, there's just a, basically an enormous mapping of addresses to indices. And, and so this image, which is, you know, whatever, it's 100 by 100, 24 by 24, uh, that, that, that single image, yeah, we hash that and then and, and put that into the uh, contract and then and on the github page because the contracts are open source they might as well be doing that everything's by definition open source in ethereum so we we had the contract open source and and on that github page we we're like here's how to validate uh you know that, that this is the image yeah so the ownership is actually stored in the data structures in the contract managed by the blockchain so you, you can go to the contract directly and put in like you know zero and see an account and that's the owner of uh, of the of punk zero. You see that mapping. So that's how the ownership is done. And what was the second question? Uh, getting started. Oh yeah, how did we get started? Yeah, I mean just hitting the hitting the docs. You know, like we did, yeah. and looking at examples. That we we're very we're very example driven in how we learn stuff. So we, we just looked at a lot of examples, and uh, like we started from like the, the most common example is like here's how to make your own token, right? And and there's a lot of overlap there because there's still like transferring and stuff going on. So we started from that. Like okay start from a contract that makes its own token and now let's sort of make it specific to 10,000 tokens. And we just sort of start picking yeah, we just sort of transform that example. The yeah. code, this uh, contract is sort of a token. Like it, it implements like half of those methods. So you can track your balance in your, in your wallet and stuff like that. And we have a symbol and all those things. You just can't buy and sell them because they're, the numbers are unique. You can't say like sell five. That means punk five, not five yeah, or, units. Or, or so, 0.05. Or you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 0.05. Yep. Okay. okay, well, thanks. Any, any more questions? We'll be around later. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we need you to close this out or just, uh, yeah, just, just quit it? Okay. Yeah. There you go. I just need to unmute your mic and you're all ready to go.
Hello? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay, my name is Ryan. I'm <coughs> with Foam. Um, Foam is actually an Ethereum protocol for um, geospatial coordinates. Um, it's quite complicated. The idea is basically, though, to create a new token layer for the city. Uh, it's not what I'm talking about today, but it's what my full-time job is. But what I'm here to talk about is how I got started with blockchain. Uh, with a project called Foam DAO. Uh, and for us, DAO meant a decentralized architecture office because we were all architects. Uh, we're thinking how blockchain can help affect the production of architecture. Um, and so the first project that we did about two years ago was called Foam Space. And it was the winner of the Storefront for Art and Architecture Street Architecture Prize competition uh, for an installation that could be built with the new museum here in New York. Um, so our project was called Foam Space, and the competition that we won was to build mobile architecture, uh, something that can be deployed in the street and then uh, packed up and moved somewhere else. Uh, we had a little bit of a different idea of mobility, and we instead proposed a project to capture and store value um, and mobilize the value instead of the actual architecture. Um, so with the Foam Space installation, we had both an installation, a platform, and then we sold the installation to create a fund. And the platform we had also gave out tokens to everyone who came. Um, this was prior to Ethereum launching, so it was on the counterparty uh, Bitcoin network. Uh, so the actual foam space installation was made out of geofoam blocks, which you might have never heard of, but they're actually underneath many roads, railway embankments, city field, Yankee Stadium, the New Jersey Turnpike, et cetera. Uh, and there's just these giant foam blocks. Um, and we decided to make our entire installation out of these foam blocks. We kind of saw it as a visual metaphor for the blockchain so that you could actually build the blockchain in the street. Um, but like I said, the main idea behind it was then to create a mobile value of architecture. So we also launched alongside this installation foam space coin. Um, so the installation took over the entire street out of these foam blocks. It was part of a larger festival. So it served as kind of the framework for people to hang out and participate, but it was only really a six hour event. Um, here you can see what I mean, and this was kind of the entire city block. Uh, people were using it for shelter, there was different kind of programming within, and it was up for the entire day. Um, the part of the competition that we won was that you had to be able to take it down within a few hours and unpack it up. Um, so like, as I mentioned, we launched our own coin in parallel to this installation on the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, and we gave out a mobile wallet to everybody who wanted to sign, and we kind of covered the transaction fees with our budget, so we gave out basically free tokens to anyone who wanted to sign up. And this basically represented membership in our community. Um, just a kind of cryptographic token saying that you were part of this installation. And because the installation was so short, we wanted a way to kind of capture the value of everyone who came and store that value in a cryptographic token. Um, so this is more like an aerial view of what the installation actually looked like. Um, and then basically at the end of the day, what we did was we had a block sale, kind of a joke on uh, how blockchains launch themselves, and we then packed up all these geofoam blocks and sold them back on the secondary materials market, because this was like a raw construction material used in construction, and we loaded them up on the truck, as you can see, and basically sold them. So we got back over 60% of the budget for the entire installation, and we had over 250 people sign for tokens, and now we have this kind of fund to back this crypto token and this community of decentralized architects we organized. Um, so that's kind of the beginning of the story, and what we then did next was mobilize this value that we created and stored in the token. And what we did next was a project called the Tropical Mining Station. So this was an installation that was built and displayed at the Chicago Architecture Biennial. And while the first project was about exploring tokens and capturing value of space, this was actually about exploring the spatial implications of blockchain. So we wanted to see what happens with all the heat that miners create and how you could potentially create space out of all the heat. Um, so what we did was we built and bought with the fund from the foam space installation uh, Ethereum miners and a custom mining rig that we set up. And we attached it to a fan. And the idea was this fan could inflate a inflatable bubble that could capture and store all the extra heat. 
from the miners so that you'd be mining Ethereum, making a profit, and then you could create a space out of the extra heat and warm a space for free. Um, so this is a photo of those miners in the case. And here is the bubble that we started to create out of that. Um, and it inflated with all the heat and uh, metaphorically the bubble in Ethereum, but also a bubble full of hot air. Um, <laughs> and basically we had a symposium inside. It was called The Art of Economy. It was an all day event with architects, theorists, and people talking about blockchain, finance, um, and the city. And here are just some photos of that installation, uh, as you can see. And Basically, just this past May, the consensus put on a conference called Ethereal to explore Ethereum and how to art and cultural components. So they basically recommissioned uh, this installation and we recreated it at about double the size. So this was the Ethereal conference here in Brooklyn. Um, and that was then the bubble we made for that uh, quite large. Again, the same concept where the Ethereum miners are on the outside mining and the heat was getting pumped into the bubble. Uh, so you could spatialize the node, be part of the network, go inside it, and then also use the surplus energy. Um, inside was an art installation by the artist Simon Denny. Uh, he had a pretty cool piece, which was a risk board with Vitalik space on it. Uh, and all the pieces were different Ethereum projects. Um, that's like a better photo of it there. Uh, so that was a pretty cool piece to have inside, and Simon was pretty great. Here's just the um, panorama view of what it looked like. Um, that's the miner from the day of Ethereum that we had running on the outside of the bubble. And here's just a closing piece of uh, Joe Lubin, one of the founders of Ethereum, playing Global Risk on the metallic board. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, anybody have any questions? It was terrible. It was also in direct sunlight, so I think that was really the main driver of heat. <laughs> um, well, during Ethereal, basically none, because it was so late, but the first installation we were mining when Ether was still like 20 cents, and we had it running for like four days straight, so good amount. Okay, thanks guys. Um, nothing, they still exist though. They're on the Bitcoin blockchain. Yeah, but they were just kind of symbolic, like membership in the community <laughs> that you got, that got a token for free, and now you could like propose for what to do with the fund. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a token and want to give it to me, I can give you the phone. <laughs> <laughs> What's up? Uh, there's a service called Counterparty. It still exists where you can create di custom digital assets on the Bitcoin blockchain. So we just created like foam space tokens, issued a thousand, but it was on top of the Bitcoin network. It's not, it's called Counterparty. Uh, color coins like a side chain. This is like on the actual Bitcoin blockchain. On your website, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the protocol is still under development, but the idea is like that you could just layer smart contracts at the same base coordinate, so that they could all share the same location and get their own index space there. So you could have like energy production, Pokemon Go, and real estate all sharing the same coordinate. All right. Thanks. Am I good? You guys can hear me? 
Hey, um, my name's Matt Spoke. Um, I'm in town from Toronto. Uh, I run a company called Nuco up in Toronto. We've been doing kind of enterprise blockchain stuff for a couple of years. Um, Mike mentioned earlier we're, we're part of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. I sit on the board of directors there. So we've been doing a whole bunch of like private blockchain stuff with big companies for a little while. So I uh, just wanted to talk to you a little bit about our new project, Aeon. Um, Aeon is... Uh, we're positioning it kind of as what comes after you start building individual blockchains that are really powerful is the fact that you need to start connecting these blockchains to each other. We're particularly focused on the fact that there's going to be private blockchains in existence as well as public blockchains in existence. And at some point, they're going to have to move value and data between each other. So third generation of blockchain network kind of implies that there's obviously two pre uh, predecessor generations. So the first generation very focused on kind of value transmission. You'll notice, you know, with Bitcoin as well as Ripple, you know, one potentially more the enterprise solution to the other, both focused on like a token of value that you can shift back and forth between end, uh, end users, um, you know, relatively simple protocols that are focused on a very specific function. After that, we obviously saw the advent of blockchains like Ethereum, Hyperledger getting developed by, by IBM, the work we're doing at the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, it's still focused on kind of how do you create these smart contract-based systems for, you know, a little bit more logic on the blockchain. Um, and then, you know, what haven't we solved when we look at those two generations? Uh, four kind of specific things that we're looking at. One is uh, the concept of isolation among blockchains. The fact that if you want to move between blockchains, you end up having to pretty heavily rely on some sort of intermediary, whether that's an exchange or somebody that's in place to recognize that a state has changed on one of these blockchains. Um, the other thing is obvious is scalability, looking at any one blockchain as being relatively uh, difficult to scale on. Um, I think you, these guys mentioned earlier the, the status ICO that kind of proved this scalability problem that kind of occurred on the Ethereum blockchain for about a day or two. Um, privacy, if you're a large enterprise, it's got kind of requirements for transactions taking place without the entire world seeing them. There's a, a whole kind of area of development that's getting done around that. Uh, and finally, performance. So how many transactions could these networks maintain um, if you're going through something like the EVM or you know, alternatives on Hyperledger and other blockchains that are getting developed out there? So to solve all of these things, we were building Aon. Um, you can check out our, our website, uh, aon.network. Um, we, we've got published today um, kind of an executive summary in English and Chinese, Russian coming out in a couple of days, uh, white paper in English, Chinese coming out in a couple of days. Um, and we'll be kind of publishing a few more papers following that. After the, so the executive summary we're kind of treating as our, our, um, our technical introduction. We're, we're following that over the next few months with four more kind of deeper dive academic papers around different architectural components of what we're building with Aon. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll touch on them really, really quickly to give you an understanding of what it is. Uh, Aon is essentially a concept of a network of many blockchains. So how would you allow for states to get recognized across blockchains? So that state could be the movement of a token. It could be something a lot more generic, like uh, update of somebody's address on their driver's license or whatever the case might be in the future. So whether these states are changing on private blockchains or public blockchains, whether they're Ethereum-based blockchains or you know, Hyperledger or some other protocol that hasn't yet been developed or EOS or whatever the case might be, these states right now exist within the parameters of their own networks. And we want to create a mechanism so I can, I can transact on one blockchain as a result of a transaction that took place on another blockchain. Uh, and have these things kind of trigger each other without a centralized intermediary being in the mix. So we do that um, kind of three major functions. Function number one is federating. So the, essentially the ability for a transaction to get recognized on many blockchains. I'll talk a little bit about how that works. Um, but a federated transaction is a transaction that essentially spans more than one blockchain. Um, we, we use the network to scale. So essentially building applications that are natively resident on more than one blockchain. So an application that can pull functions from different blockchains and trigger functions on different blockchains, where would you house that application and how would you make sure that it doesn't itself become a point of vulnerability? Um, and then finally, the idea that from this Aon network, you can kind of create spokes from the hub. So these spokes can be dedicated blockchains that have their own parameters that decide on their own consensus and governance structures uh, and that are all kind of connected back to the hub to be able to transmit. So. Um, I'll, I'll jump a little bit into the architecture and then I'll jump into questions because it's a lot to kind of cover quickly, but I don't want to take up too much time. So uh, a high level view of how Aon looks, um, we, we kind of refer to it as like a multi-tiered blockchain system. So at, at the root of the network is a routing network. It's a blockchain that we're building called Aon One. 
Aon One has kind of a, a native virtual machine that, that'll be able to run applications. But probably more importantly than that, it acts as the router to the rest of the network. So blockchains that connect Aon One essentially can send transactions and state not only the destination address, but the destination network of the transaction that they're, they're emitting. Um, one of the things that we realized pretty early on is if you want two blockchains to connect to each other, uh, or at least be aware of each other's state, it was relatively straightforward. You could, you could make one blockchain essentially a representation of like a light client of the next blockchain, and they could track like block headers and essentially recreate like a Merkle tree and be able to prove that transactions took place. So from a one-to-one -one perspective, it was a solvable problem where, you know, transaction number one or blockchain number one could trigger transactions based on transactions happening on blockchain number two. Where it became challenging was if we scale that hypothesis to a possible future state where there are hundreds of thousands of blockchains, some which are massive public blockchains, some which are kind of micro enterprise blockchains. And all of a sudden, if you want transactions to span across these networks, any one blockchain has to be aware of every other blockchain and that becomes unscalable. So instead we introduced the concept of an intermediary chain that acts as the router. So as long as I'm aware of the router chain, Aon One, then I can send transactions to any other blockchain that is connected to that same router essentially. Uh, so this is kind of the concept of the, the, the multi-tiered blockchain. At different levels of the, of the tiers, essentially you can act as a router to blockchains that are kind of subordinate to you as well. So you can, you can route through different levels and there's this kind of model that we're working on around Aon One being the first router that we developed, but other people could come in and provide kind of a better routing system. And then all of a sudden you could have people kind of shifting where they're routing their transactions. So three kind of core characteristics of Aon. One is the concept of this new public blockchain called Aon One. Uh, one of the, the kind of core designs we had to drive to on Aon One was a non-forking public blockchain. Um, essentially that if I pass the transaction through this router, and it got accepted by another blockchain and then ended up on an orphan block that got dropped by the router, then all of a sudden I have a problem of somebody having accepted as valid a transaction that is no longer valid. Uh, and instead of wanting to wait, let's say six to 10 blocks to have some sort of confidence that the transaction is final, could we create a blockchain that doesn't fork? So we're, we're, we're building kind of a consensus mechanism that allows us to do that. Um, outside of Aon, one is the concept of bridges. These are decentralized protocols that essentially allow a group of validating nodes to witness transactions and pass on a message that they've witnessed that transaction. So on that bridge, you can have a group of nodes that are essentially participating in both blockchains that they're connecting. Uh, they can see that something has taken place. They can sign the fact that they agree that it is a valid transaction. And then as long as the bridge receives two thirds or more of the signatures required of the bridge validators, then it transmits the transaction as a valid transaction on to the rest of the network essentially. Um, and there's a, a token kind of mechanic that sits behind that that stakes the blockchain bridge so that if people are acting dishonestly, they can lose their stake. And if they're acting honestly, they can charge a fee. So they can charge a fee for moving transactions across the bridge. Uh, and then the third characteristic is obviously what we call participating networks. These are blockchains that connect into Aon One. Um, one of the core designs that we were working on is the fact that we don't want to enforce a protocol on these participating networks. So these participating blockchains can be designed based on you know, the imagination of their creators, whether they're Ethereum based or Hyperledger based or R3 based or EOS based, doesn't really matter as long as they meet a very, very lightweight interface on how do you interface with a bridge. So that's kind of the high level principle about, uh, around Aon. So um, I'll stop there. There's a whole bunch of use cases that we're kind of developing on this in parallel. Um, I'm not allowed to advertise in the US that we're doing a token sale, so I'm not here to do that. Um, but this is, uh, this is our team up in Toronto. We're all based in Toronto right now. We're growing pretty dramatically quickly. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about what we're doing, you can check us out and get in touch. But I'll take any questions if anybody's got any. Yeah. So the time depends on how far it needs to get routed. So. Uh, I'm not. No, because the, the most of the scale we're pushing down to the individual kind of participating blockchain. So the idea is that most, transaction can take, can take, most transactions can take place within a single blockchain. And then only, the only thing that our, net, our protocol needs to support is transactions that have a requirement. Blockchain, blockchain. So in, most transactions, are, you know, simple example, um, you want to trigger um, uh, an Ethereum classic transaction using an Ethereum transaction. So some sort of Ethereum transaction uh, confirming would autonomously be able to trigger some sort of Ethereum classic transaction triggering. 
Um, you can make these two chains aware of each other. In fact, there's a protocol getting developed right now called Peace Relay that allows essentially any Ethereum style blockchain to be aware of each other. Um, but if you were to scale that to maybe there are, you know, the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, what we're working on with all these companies is about 200 companies that are now members of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. Uh, they're all building their own like private Ethereum blockchains. Um, at some point, there's going to be so many of them that making them all aware of each other becomes really challenging. So, uh, you know, we're building a blockchain right now focused on commodity settlement with uh, the Toronto Stock Exchange. That commodity settlement contract needs to eventually trigger a payment. And the, the hypothesis is that payment eventually will be on another blockchain. So you, these transactions to kind of move across networks such that you can trust kind of that transmission without having to go through some sort of intermediary to translate that. So there is an intermediary process, but it's a decentralized intermediary process. It's this chain and this bridge, essentially, that allows you to move that data. Yeah. Sure. So first question, um, I'll caveat by saying I'm on the board of directors of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, so I will only say positive things, whether they are true or not. Um, the, the, I'd say they're, most of the companies that have joined have a pretty legitimate passion for Ethereum. Um, I think it's quite different to a lot of the companies that I know are part of our three. <laughs> there's not a dedicated passion behind those groups. Um, there's some of the companies, most of the founding companies, there was 32 founding companies, there's 11 of us on the board of directors. The 32 founding companies spent a lot of time, money, and effort to, to create the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. So you'll find in each of these companies a very passionate, dedicated team of Ethereum like enthusiasts. Includes JP Morgan, includes uh, Consensus, includes Microsoft. Like there are some hardcore enthusiasts, obviously goes without saying that consensus has some Ethereum enthusiasts in it. Uh, but these other companies, you know, there are some hardcore, like very, um, you know, well-versed people that know this stuff pretty well. Um, the rest of the companies, you know, they all have their different motivations. Some are absolutely joining for like, a press release and some are joining because they legitimately have some, you know, uh, contributions to make into the technical community. So there's a whole bunch of working groups that have been developed under the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, a general technical steering committee, uh, but like working groups around like banking use cases and insurance use cases and all this stuff. So companies tend to be organizing themselves based on industry use cases and, and working on like standardization and how you might approach a payments use case using like an Ethereum style blockchain essentially. Um, so that's, that's the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. Your second question, how much does it cost to participate in Aon? So Aon is, I mean, it's a decentralized protocol, meaning that the, there will be a free market for these things. So a simple example would be um, building a bridge between two blockchains is not like there will be a single bridge. If a bridge is too centralized or too expensive, somebody could create an alternative bridge that is less centralized and less expensive. Uh, and then uh, essentially the market will determine where people are routing their transactions. Uh, on, the main, on, the, on the routing network, there will be a group of validating nodes that will get rewarded uh, you know, by block creation essentially. Uh, on the bridges, there will be a group of nodes that decide whether they want to charge anything or if they want to charge a lot or somewhere in the middle. Um, even the validating nodes on the, on, the, on the routing network, on the intermediary chain, it's a delegated consensus system, so they'll have backers behind them, and they'll be able to decide their own market rate of how much reward they keep for themselves versus how much they distribute to their backers. All of this is intended to be kind of free market. Um, so there's no inherent cost. It's just whatever the market kind of implies. Yeah. Um, uh, to TBD, I'll let you figure out. Uh, we're, we're working on some similar concepts to Polkadot. Um, I think one of the unique angles that we're approaching this from is how we're seeing this as a mechanism to essentially bring enterprise implementations into public infrastructure. So right now, a lot of enterprise blockchains are kind of happening in isolation. So we're coming at this from an, a perspective of like, how do you get enterprises to participate in public blockchains in some way, still giving them the ability to kind of define their own requirements and parameters around security and privacy and things like that. Um, you'll find a lot of similarities architecturally between us and Polkadot. You'll probably also find some similarities between us and Cosmos. Uh, there's some nuanced differences in how we're approaching it and differences on timeline and of execution and things like that. But um, I think at some point, these things all boil down to a small number of standards. We're just approaching it slightly differently right now. Any other questions? All right, I'll stick around after if anybody's got any questions. Thanks a lot. <laughs>